Hey guys, so this is a uh, response video of sorts, uh, more a commentary really. So about 16 months ago, uh, the 8-bit guy did a video titled Documentary, the Sinclair ZX80, 81 and Sinclair the Timex Sinclair 1000 um, and uh, there's a couple of things, there's a couple of things. If, there's a, if you read the comments for that video I mean I'll do a link to the video in the description so you can have a look at the original thing as with all the 8-bit guy stuff it's really you know his videos are really really good they're really detailed really informative I, I enjoy them I like you know I'm a, a subscriber to it I like his content a lot watch him a lot so this isn't really anybody having a pop particularly, but there are a couple of things that he says about the ZX80 that I think are maybe a little bit harsh. Um, and actually, if you look into the comments um, section, you'll actually see a reply from Jeff Minter, um, who, uh, you know, uh, you probably don't need me to tell you who Jeff, Jeff Minter is. So that guy really knows what he's talking about, and he, and he gives some very kind of uh, bit of a, a critique on the video. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of things in it. I think... As I've thought about it, I think part of the issue is that, and this is this is to kind of everybody on the US side of the pond, or frankly, just anybody who isn't in the UK. Um, if particularly, but but it's quite polarised with the UK and US um, thing in the early in the late seventies, early eighties, is there were very marked differences economically. I think it's fair to say, so the type of computer that Joe Public in the US could afford and the type of computer that Joe Public in the UK could afford were very, very different. Like, really different. Um, but you wouldn't know that if you weren't here. So I think in the defence of the 8-bit guy, he's basically going, well, look, on the one hand, you've got an Atari. On the other hand, you've got the ZX80. What the hell? Um, but, yeah, which you would do if, you, if you'd never sort of physically experienced it. But... Um, because it's interesting, and I, and, I, and I want to touch on this idea of affordable computing, because affordable is, is always used, to be honest, typically when things aren't affordable. We still use it today, affordable housing, you know, but if you're not both earning a full-time wage, then you're going to struggle. Well, that's then not affordable housing. So, and it's the same with affordable computers. So I'll stop waffling. Let's have a look at the video. Um, and here we go. I want to take you back to the year 1980. Three years earlier, several personal computers had made their way to the market, such as the Apple II, TRS-80, and Commodore PET. And while all these computers were considered very affordable for the time, they were still out of reach for a lot of people. Yes, I'm just going to pause it there quickly. So, yeah, he's absolutely right. So the thing with this is that um, the the first three that came out. Is, is absolutely right. I mean, they, they were, again, classed as affordable. Well they, well, they weren't even particularly affordable in America unless you were sort of what they class as the middle class and upwards. Um, and if you look at these prices here, you know, they um, those systems, when you ship them to the UK, by the time you'd added freight, shipping, tax, etc., it was pretty much coming out at the same price in pounds in the UK that it was coming out at um, in dollars in the US. And... There's a couple of things that I want to point out is is that, that feed into the rest of this video. Around about sort of 1980-ish, the average salary in the UK was about six thousand um, pounds, and uh, and a conversion rate was about fifty pence to a dollar. So these were coming out at around about so to, to buy an Apple II, you know, or to buy any of these computers, you were talking like a tenth of your annual salary, <laughs> gross annual salary. So these these completely were not affordable unless you were like a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. Um, you know, they're, they're totally not affordable. Anyway, we'll press on. By 1979, some more affordable options began to show up, such as the Texas Instruments TI 994 and the Atari 400. Both of these costing around $550 at the time. Right. Okay. So again, um, y yes and no. So again, we're talking about affordable computing now in the U.S. The Apple II and everything came out, those original three, they were expensive. Then affordable computing came out. But, 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 if you go to the UK in the same time period, I looked it up and the Atari 400 was about £350. So they'd obviously got better at the shipping and the freight and everything like that, but it was still £350. And again, the average salary being, that, that, that's still like a fifth, a fifth of your gross annual earnings. Um, that's a lot of money that's a lot of money and this is the whole point because here you, you cannot compare in affordable computing terms you cannot compare 
the computers that you're seeing on the screen now, particularly something like the Atari, or I would also put the Commodore 64 into this category, although that obviously came a little bit later, but specifically for 1980, you can't compare this against the ZX80. You just can't, because they're, they're dealing with totally different economical constraints. Um, these are these are not affordable computers. So this, by comparison, is like trying to compare, you know, a mainframe to a computer in 1980, and going, well, the mainframe's loads more powerful. It's you can do so much more. Why would you not just buy a mainframe? Um, it's affordable. Yeah. So anyway, let's just press on a little bit. Now, while these newer computers were cheaper, they were also better because they had added considerably more advanced graphics and sound capabilities. And these computers were capable of more than just being computers. They could wow their customers with fancy video games. And while these computers were more affordable than ever before, another computer was about to enter the market which would really bring the cost down. If you thought I was about to say the Commodore VIC-20, that was a good guess. But that wouldn't show up on the market until 1981. No, I'm talking about the Sinclair ZX80. Now, this was designed by a company in the UK called Science of Cambridge, but they later changed their name to Sinclair Research. There was literally one design goal for this computer, that it would be cheap. <laughs> and that is this computer's distinguishing... Okay, so... <laughs> um, yeah, cheeky little, cheeky little laugh there aside. Um, there's a couple of things on that one. Um, Actually, let me just change your screen back. There we go. Yes, yes and no. So the, the, there wasn't um, there wasn't just one design goal in mind. So Clive Sinclair's main goal was the same as all the other guys were talking about. Steve Jobs and everybody had this thing of a computer in every house. That was that was the goal. Okay. So then, in order to meet that goal, you had to have this other goal of cheap economical and you, you you can't have one without the other um, and again like I said you can't say that you can't do it with the you couldn't do that with the um, the, the Atari 400 or any other computers which were out at that time because they weren't affordable at least not in the world of the U not in the UK they, they weren't affordable um, if you look at, particularly again, if you look at the comments that Jeff Minter made, he's, he's, he's said outright that even for the 80, and I think later on the 81, he had to do his day job and do extra jobs to buy this machine. This, this is how much of a tank the UK economy was in. We just, this, this, it wasn't available to us. Without this computer being as it was, we'd, I don't know where we'd be. Um, it would have took another five years probably before we'd have got anywhere. Um, so it's, it's, Yes, the computer needed to be cheap, but actually the objective, the goal, was to get the computer in front of the people. And also bear in mind, at this point, in the UK again, the, the 80s kind of sitting on that line between a hobbyist computer and a, and a home computer. Um, at this point, it's still sort of the tipping balance. He's trying the water with this machine, to be honest, and it's still necessarily... The, 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 it's still available in kit form for a start, um, as was the 81, actually. But the 81, actually, got for, that was for sale in WH Smith's. So that kind of made the transition. At this point, we're still sort of dealing with a hobbyist machine. Um, right, I'm going to skip ahead now to around about 10 minutes. 11 minutes, where is it? I always look for the little space invaders thing. Okay. Face it. Uh, the ZX80 is a terrible computer. Um, you know, it was designed. <laughs> okay, let's go back a bit. I've, I've ruined the, I've ruined the surprise there, but wait for given it. What they had Again, to work with. you didn't hear that. The most amazing part is that it's able to multiplex the gameplay with the video display so that the game works simultaneously with video. Okay, let's face it, uh, the ZX80 is a terrible computer. Um, you know, it was designed with one goal in mind, and that was to be cheap. And while it did achieve that goal, uh, it came at the cost of essentially reducing the computer down to a glorified calculator that could just happen to connect to your TV rather than being a, an actual real computer. Now, don't get me wrong, the computer was a commercial success, and I suppose a lot of people probably got their start in computers using this product. And so I can't fault it for that. However, there's probably also a lot of people who got their start and a very quick finish in the computer industry because they started with one of these. So that can go both ways. Yeah, I mean, okay, look, let's, let's, fair point. Um, if you used it and thought, what the heck is this? Um, fair enough. But again, I think it's a little bit missing the point with it. Um, it, it, 
it's it's, it's not, not a terrible computer. computer. Um, it's, it's just you've got to you've, you've got to shut your mind to, in order to you've, you've got to shut your mind to an Atari and a, and, a, and the other computers that were there. You've got to get those out of your head because they're just physically not even remotely an option. So it's not a terrible computer. It's just a very very budget computer which is absolutely what it needed to be in order to get in front of people so yeah i think that's a little bit unfair um now in fairness it goes on to talk about zx81 he's very positive about that etc etc but yeah that's it i just wanted to do that i've been itching to do this video for a little bit um just over 10 minute marks that's good i wanted to keep it fairly short so that's all i've got to say on it really i think that, i think it's an but the thing is as well i think before we judge Mr. 8-Bit Guy uh, too harshly. I think the problem is is that unless you were there, you don't really understand the wider context of it, so it's very easy just to go, well, look, let's just analyse this computer for what it is. Yeah, it's a terrible computer. Well, uh, no, it's very limited. It's very limited, and it's very budget. But is it a terrible computer? No, and it was much more than a glorified calculator. You could type basic programs in. 1K memory, yes, you're very limited. It's probably a screen full of text or whatever. But nonetheless, you could get a start with it. Um, and don't, don't take that from me. Take that from, like I say, in the comments section, you can see Jeff's comments around that. Jeff Minter, so take it from him. Um, but that's it. Let me know what you think. Um, keen to know whether you agree or disagree. Okay, take care.